very shiny. <laughs> All right, it is 4.50, so I think we'll go ahead and begin. Hi, everyone. I'm Hannah Rosenberg. Um, I do all kinds of things in Chicago. <laughs> um, I have a business, Bellas Commerce, which helps people integrate crypto into their existing businesses. Um, I also do a lot of educational stuff. I'm repping Blockchain Institute today, a nonprofit for blockchain education. And I know a lot of you guys from the meetup, the Bitcoin and Open Blockchain Meetup. But we want to get straight into the good stuff. So I'm going to have uh, our panelists introduce themselves. We did have a little bit of change of schedule today. So Hashgraph has dropped off the panel. And we have a last minute sub, and that is Frederick from Enigma. So thank you, Frederick, for coming in last minute. So I'd like everyone to please just go and quickly introduce yourself and keep it nice and brief so we can get straight to the discussion. I'm Jimmy Sung. I'm a Bitcoin developer, educator, and entrepreneur. Hi, I'm Marco Perboom. Uh, I'm one of the developers on Decred Project. I'm Colin LeMayhew, and I'm the founder of Nano. I'm Frederick Fortier, and I'm a developer for Enigma. Excellent. Welcome, everyone. All right. So if you wouldn't mind briefly telling everyone about the, how the project that you're here representing scales. And we don't want to do a deep dive on consensus algorithms. So let's keep it fairly brief, a you know, 30 second overview on how scaling works in the system you work with. Uh, Bitcoin has some um, on-chain capacity. Uh, certainly SegWit doubled the block size, so that, that uh, expanded it in that way. But I think what Bitcoin is doing is going towards second layer solutions like Lightning and sidechains, and those offer four to five orders of magnitude more capacity than on-chain solutions. So I would say that that is the direction that Bitcoin is going in. So Decred is uh, taking a slightly different approach. Um, since we have a working uh, governance model, that allows us to actually make these decisions a little bit later in the future. So um, we will see what we will do based on the data that we gather when it becomes a problem. Uh, so nano scales by processing transactions and organizing them individually instead of processing the transaction once and then having a block come by later. So by doing them individually, we don't have to repeat the data. Uh, Enigma is... Um platform for privacy preserving smart contract. Currently, our validation layer or verification layer is uh, Ethereum. Uh, it scales because the computations are done uh, in the Enigma network as opposed to in Ethereum. So we can offload the computational load and the storage load from Ethereum. Um, and yeah, so that, that's basically it. All right, thank you. So we're going to talk about scaling, of course. So transactions per second. So for the projects that you work with, in theory, how many transactions per second can go through your system? And in reality, what's actually the most transactions per second that's been demonstrated? So uh, Bitcoin, at least on chain, does about three to six transactions per second. And there certainly have been times when that has occurred. But utilizing Lightning, you can get many orders of magnitude greater than that because instead of broadcasting the transaction to everybody else on the network, uh, which, which is required with on-chain, on with something like Lightning, only the people that need to know about it find out about it. So the transmission is, uh, is a lot less, and it's uh, also privacy preserving because only the people that need to know about it know about it. And as a result, you can get way more transactions. The nice thing is because of the privacy preserving aspect of Lightning, uh, you actually don't know exactly how many transactions are going through. Only if you're a routing node or an end node do you know about any of the transactions that are actually happening. Uh, but you know the testing that they've done, it's, uh, it's many orders of magnitude better. Uh, it's hard to say, though, because of the privacy-preserving aspects to know exactly how many transactions per second are going through. Uh, but suffice it to say, it's definitely enough because the capacity on Lightning, the people that have transacted on Lightning, it's, it, it definitely works for what, uh, you know, uh, the, the stores that have been there and for uh, money transmission and so on. So in, in Degret, we actually have a similar story, but roughly the same number of transactions. Um, but you are also working on Lightning. So um, 
we have created what you will, if you will, a, um, a translation layer that translates the Bitcoin bits into Decred bits, and it allows us to to run uh, Lightning as well. So we are not quite finished with that yet, but um, but soon, Lightning soon. <laughs> so, but um, but we are getting close enough that we are also going to actually release that, and we are going to use that as a also a mechanism of scaling. Um, so with Nano, there isn't an intrinsic limit on how many transactions per second that can go through it. It's primarily going to be limited by network bandwidth and then probably I.O. and then CPU power afterwards. So in actual mainnet tests, we've done dozens of transactions per second, peaked at several hundreds of transactions per second with some improvements that we're making in the pipeline to basically decrease the amount of bandwidth it takes to communicate. We're, we're hoping that's going to go up. And then, of course, if we wanted to in the future add a lightning-style layer on top of it, obviously we can make use of that too. Yeah. How many has it actually done? Like, uh, like how many people actually use it? And how, like, not mainnet testing, but mainnet usage. How many people use it? Of course, or I wouldn't be like, able to what tell was that. the highest transactions per second without like actual stress testing? Like, was it uh, like with actual users? Uh, Twenty. Okay. Dozens. Dozens. Yep, okay. dozens. Um, in our case, our network is specialized in computations, um, so it can run some fairly expensive types of computations. So, really, the number of transactions per second is based on the complexity of the computation that needs to be executed, so it's hard to give a number. Uh, however, it's very fast because of some attributes of our network where um, only a limited number of nodes um, have to execute each computation at the same time. Um, so there's limited overhead on that. So uh, we anticipate that it's going to be very fast, but we don't have a mainnet yet, and uh, really it's based on the nature of the computation. Cool. So let's back up to just theory a little bit. When do you know you need to scale, and how much scale is enough? I think uh, that, that's a very difficult question to answer without market participation. So when, um, when there is sort of a stress or uh, problems on the network, or people aren't getting what they want, I, I think that's, that's when entrepreneurs are supposed to step in, not necessarily like developers or central authorities or people that uh, want to centrally plan stuff. It's, it's more entrepreneurs that say, okay, well, these people want to transact, but they don't want to pay this much or whatever. And therefore, I'm going to provide a service that's better that allows them to do what they want for a cheaper price. When there, uh, when there are, when there's an arbitrage opportunity, that's when people want, will you know, find good business models and so on. So for me, it's not, uh, when you find out is when entrepreneurs figure this out. When they figure out, okay, there's a profit opportunity there because there's so many people that have wanted something and they didn't get it. Um, that's, that, that's up to the entrepreneur to figure out and not necessarily like some objective metric, quote unquote, or some, you know, like fees at a certain dollar amount or something like that. It's entrepreneurs. Cool. Any other thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I take a different approach. Rather than kind of doing scalability as a bolt-on solution in the aftermath, I think that your system needs to be designed from the beginning to be as efficient as possible at every single layer. Otherwise, you're going to come up with substandard solutions. I mean, a second layer solution can be added to any system, and it's going to reap a lot more benefits if it's built on a system that can do more on-chain transactions per second natively. OK. Well, let's um, segue from that and get into the uh, nitty gritty of it here. So transactions per second is great, but it's meaningless if your transactions aren't secure, right? So Bitcoin has you know, proof of work and the longest chain, and this consensus mechanism, this security mechanism, is the most well-tested and the most well-proven. So for example, uh, Nano, I think you use delegated proof of stake, yep. right? And Decred's uh, combination proof of work, proof of stake, correct. correct? So convince the audience that these mechanisms are secure enough. So not just that you can do that many transactions, but those transactions will be secure. So all of these systems have a security parameter, which is the confirmation point. And 
the confirmation point is the point at which we say this transaction is permanent. Any additional security after that permanence is wasted effort. There's no such thing as more permanent than permanent. So Nano doesn't spend any effort trying to make something more secure after the confirmation threshold has been reached. Hmm. Uh, how's that secure? Because it's permanent, it's reached the confirmation threshold. It's, it's only permanent because you say it's permanent, or the delegated proof of stakers say it's permanent. But why, why should we trust the delegated proof of stake nodes? Why should you trust them? Yeah, because they're, they're essentially the ones that say it's permanent, but why, 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 why can you trust them? Like, what, what, what's to prevent them from Well, lying? because if I, did, uh, if I used different transactions other than the ones that are done by those representatives, then I can't spend or use my money anywhere. Yeah, so, I can't you're, buy you're, there, so they're like an elite that decide whether or not transactions go through. The only people that matter in any sort of currency is, will someone accept my currency? So I can go to them and say, will Oh, that's not the only thing that matters. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Scarcity matters. Decentralization matters. All, uh, like the easiness, uh, easiness of money matters. I don't think you can say that it, whether or not somebody else accepts it for that temporary amount of time is the only thing that matters. That's a very method of payment oriented view. People definitely care about store of value. Are you going to accept something that has no scarcity? No. Right. But you just said that the only thing that matters right. is whether or not somebody accepts it. I mean, in, right. in Venezuela, people accept Bolivar sometimes. But, and there's no real scarcity there. I, but that's not the only thing that matters. Uh, uh, that's a false statement. Uh, but I, I, I still disagree. don't understand the security model because if you have delegated proof of stake, you have a bunch of nodes that decide, okay, this is permanent or not, but why, why can you trust them? I don't, I, like you just said, well, it's permanent because they say so. That's not a security model. That's just trusting I, I in a bunch it, of people. I said it matters because someone will accept my currency. Right, They're, so it, it's based on other people trusting the same the central authorities. Effect. So it's the network Okay, effect. all right, so I, I, all right, that's fair. If you want to trust in central authorities, that's fine. So we're talking about securing your system, right? So let's talk about things specifically, like um, incentives on these different chains, or what percentage of honest nodes do you need to achieve, achieve Byzantine fault tolerance, right? Like, let's get specifics of what makes this secure. And not just, not just picking on Colin. Chime in here too, Marco. <laughs> no? What was the question? So what specifically what makes incentives? the system secure? What incentives do you have? Because I, right. from my reading, I understand that um, your block producers right, don't um, get paid transaction fees. Right. Yeah, so when we talk about incentives, we need to look at the incentives for all the actors in the system. So we have node operators, we have customers, and we have vendors. So Nano has a very strong uh, uh, like selling point to vendors. I can go to them and say, if you use Nano as your currency, you will save all of the tr credit card transaction fees that you are currently paying to them. That's an amazing concept, and every single vendor I've told that to wants to know about Nano, wants to install Nano. The, on the flip side, if only the node operators are getting the incentives at the expense of customers and at the expense of the vendors, that discussion goes entirely differently because I go into them and say, I have this currency, do you want to use it? You're, it doesn't cost you less to do it whatsoever. Uh, and the answer is going to be probably no, I don't want to use it. I don't want to change. So the incentives need to be evened out amongst all the actors in the system, not just the node operators at the expense of everyone else. Yes, I would agree, but you're talking about incentives for adoption more than incentives for security on your chain. Yeah, I mean, the I incentives think are that the cost to send money anywhere in the world instantaneously is zero. How does that add Byzantine fault tolerance? I thought we were talking about incentives. Yeah, well, both. Which one are we're we doing here? We're talking about security of chains. And uh, Marco, do chime in, please. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we're not. Well, so actually, uh, Decred uses a similar model to um, uh, to Bitcoin. So uh, right. we are also from the Bitcoin world. We love it. Uh, we just saw some faults with it. 
Um, so we wanted to iterate Bitcoin actually and in, uh, in add some additional things to it. And what we did is we added the proof of stake component on top of the proof of work. So we, we are a proof of work, proof of stake hybrid. And the point of the proof of stake portion is to keep miners in check. So um, as beautiful as Bitcoin is, one of the things that you cannot control is a mining farm. So, um, so we have the capability of invalidating a miner's blocks if he is, uh, or she is, or the group is misbehaving. For example, uh, if you're mining empty blocks that is not desired on the network. So we could actually slap that particular miner down and say, stop doing that, you're a bad boy. And you think that gives people greater... Um, Sovereignty. It, yeah. <laughs> But it increases uh, confidence in the security of the system. Is that well, not so much as it increases confidence. What it does is it, um, it, it prevents certain uh, attacks from, from happening. So empty bl uh, blocks have been mined on the Bitcoin chain, and, uh, and it's just not optimal. It's, it's, it's not good for network throughput. Uh, and that's just, just an example, right? So uh, the idea, though, is, is that you need to incent let's go to the incentives. So we, we incentivize all the players in the system as well. So the proof of work guys get the, the majority uh, of the state uh, of the uh, the block reward. Um, but if they misbehave according to the stakeholders, then they can get stripped. Okay. Well, let's um, change course a little bit, and we'll go back to decentralization. So scaling isn't really a problem, right? We can all spin up some Amazon you know, web servers and problem solved. The problem is scaling in a decentralized fashion. So have there been, for you know, some of the projects that claim to have big scalability, are there any decentralization trade-offs there? Well, uh, if you look at Lightning, it's actually really cleverly done so that you end up with a lot of peer-to-peer -peer payment channels. And that, that's at the heart of it. So it's very decentralized in that sense. Uh, and it's in a way more decentralized than on-chain transactions because not everyone finds out about it. If it's none of your business, you're not going to find out about it. Or you don't have to unless they, uh, the, the transactors want to tell you about it. Uh, so in that sense, I think Lightning is very decentralized, um, and certainly if we if we go towards a side chains model or something like that, that can also be extremely decentralized because you would have, uh, you know, uh, it, it's pegged to the Bitcoin chain, and it you know only the people that are running that side chain would know about it, um, and it could even be a private one, right? Like uh, I think uh, Blockstream has Liquid, uh, which is based on the Element side chain which is you know, like a private sidechain. Nobody except the people on that sidechain know about it, and it's nobody else's business. And you can do many, many transactions. And that, in a sense, it gives everyone autonomy. Um, and that's, I think, at the heart of what makes Bitcoin different than all of these other projects, is that it's largely voluntary. You, do, you make your own innovation instead of having you know, um, I thought it was incentivized. Yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, you know, I, and let let people go with that instead of having some central development team that tells you, okay, this is the way it's going to be. So, um, for that, I mean, it, it, some 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 projects do try to uh, go towards more decentral, uh, more of a decentralized model than others, but that's what makes Bitcoin different, at least for me. It's a, it's all voluntary. And you don't have to use these other tech if you don't want to. And you know, it's, uh, it's largely peer-to-peer -peer and based on entrepreneurs that want to build on stuff. Cool. So let me add a little bit to that. So, um, so in Decred, we have a proposal system that is uh, off-chain, but uh, is anchored in the chain. Um, and on top of that, then we have actually working on chain uh, voting and forking of, uh, of, new, of consensus rules or uh, protocol changes. So that gives us a change mechanism to actually alter the things. But it's pretty much the same way. So you can show up with the development team and say, hey, I want to uh, build this thing. You can actually even get funded if the uh, stakeholders agree to it. So the stakeholders could agree to, develop, to funding a development team, and then they can actually go build uh, a new piece of software that's going to go on top of it that then can be voted in uh, by the you, stakeholders. You need the permission of the network, though, right? Uh, no. So the um, it's a bit uh, ish. So the number of people on the network need to be on a certain version, mm -hmm. right? So if, if uh, the network would never upgrade, then yes, you could see that as a permission. Uh, yeah, so it, it's a slightly different model uh, in the sense that there's a, there's a vote by the community that I think Decred's put in with their proof of stake. 
and I think that's like the most rational, like least scammy way of using proof of stake, right? Like if you use it to mine, then it's, it's, it's completely centralizing. But if you're using it to vote, at least you know what the will of the majority is or what the will of the people that are in that system are. Uh, but at the same time, it's sort of, you're, you're terrorizing, the, you, it's possible to terrorize the minority a little bit because it's possible they want to do their own thing and if... Is this his system yeah. or your system? No, I'm talking oh, about... Oh, he's system. talking, right? Yeah. Okay. So I, um, I, I have a lot of respect for that idea because it is sort of based on the idea of democracy or whatever. But there, there is this possibility that there are volunteers that aren't necessarily self-sovereign over their own node and decred because the, the, you need uh, permission from other people. Well, it's not ne technically permission, right? So uh -huh. if, uh, if enough people upgrade uh, their nodes, then it will move forward. So votes will start to happen. So Only if a majority or...? It, like it's, uh, I want to say 75%, I think is the number okay. that we put on that. So mm -hmm. if 75% if of the people of the network don't upgrade for cool new features, then yes, mm -hmm. that de definitely would be a problem. Uh -huh. Although we do think that we have enough uh, width and enough people in on the project that that actually would not be a real issue. And, um, so far, so good. Uh, yeah. I could be proven wrong, but, uh, but I think that we have enough stakeholders as well that are interested in furthering the network. Well, I want to hear from the Enigma guys. All right. yeah. yeah. I want to offer it up to uh, Yeah, I guess I can provide a slightly different maybe angle on this, um, on the decentralization issue. Uh, in our case, we use a mix of um, privacy preserving um, components to sort of shackle the node operators. So right now in our initial releases, we use a trusted execution environment uh, to execute the computation. So each of the nodes of the network is executing computation in the confines of, of a trusted execution environment. And that's sort of a compromise between, um, like it's kind of a compromise because the projects that are uh, building on us might otherwise use uh, things like AWS to execute these types of computation. So we enable the types of computations that are a bit more expensive that um, would otherwise go on AWS, but we allow the same types of computation to be done on a permissionless decentralized network using this trusted hardware. So okay, am I, am I hearing this right? You are a platform on top of a platform? So you're on Ethereum and you're a platform on top of Ethereum, is that right? Yeah, yeah, we use Ethereum as a validation layer. Okay, all right, so in that case, how, how are you decentralized at all? Because if Vitalik says, we don't, uh, you're taking up too much data, we're, gonna, we're, we're going to censor your transactions, yeah. or we're going to hard fork all of your, uh, your contract away, then, I yeah, mean, like, you've you got a single point of failure there, right? I understand what you're saying philosophically, and our goal is not also to continue using Ethereum as a validation layer forever. Like we're working on both using other chains and also having our own chain. But using Ethereum as a validation layer for now is kind of a pragmatic decision because there's a lot of development done on Ethereum. There are some applications with existing smart contracts that are uh, built on Ethereum. And a lot of these applications currently, for pragmatic reason again, are uh, doing some work computations on AWS because like you said, um, storing data on Ethereum is expensive. Uh, doing certain kinds of computation on Ethereum is very expensive and difficult. So we're kind of trying to um, approach things pragmatically and having this network um, which is decentralized and permissionless that can be used to do things that are difficult to do on Ethereum right now. But I understand philosophically what you're saying. We well, I mean, it, it sounds like centralization on top of centralization to me. If you're if you're building on Ethereum, that's one layer of centralization. And if you're a platform, that's another layer of centralization. Anyone building on top of yours is depending on you to keep the whole thing alive. Um, and you could probably censor things. You're saying you can't because we have some privacy preserving features, but it's also possible that you just shut down as a platform, in which case they're screwed. So, um, I mean, I don't, I don't think privacy preservation is enough to say that it's actually decentralized. It's just, it happens to be that it's harder for you to censor a particular pl thing on the platform, but even, even then, if there's some sort of identifier, I'm sure there's a way to censor a particular um, you know, class of transactions. So, I, I don't see how it's really decentralized in any way. 
I suppose I, I understand your, your philosophical argument, like if you start with the assumption or the assertion that Ethereum is centralized, then obviously our platform is not centralized insofar as it relies on Ethereum for, for uh, verification. But I think there's, the, I think that it's arguable that Ethereum is centralized. Uh, arguable, okay. They bailed I, out I, I guess I, people, I, They've, uh, they're imposing taxes, they're going to change incentives. Sounds a lot like government, doesn't it? So, right? You can, right. You, can, you can impose new taxes. Okay, we're going to have a storage tax. We're, we're going to bail out the people that did the DAO. We're going to, I mean, like, we're going to change the proof of stake. I, that's about but, as centralized as I, I, I like. But we, I, I, we won't argue about the centralization of Ethereum right now. <laughs> well, I mean, we are, we are talking about decentralization, and that's, unless, that's we define, de, unless we define that, it's... It's we very don't hard have to an have Ethereum this representative here, so we won't delve into that right well, now. He's building but on it, so I think he's a good yeah, proxy. I'm, I'm going to agree with you that if I accept the premise that Ethereum is centralized and our platform is using Ethereum as a, a verification layer, then it's centralized. But I don't accept the premise that Ethereum is centralized. Okay. Fair okay. enough. So, last one. Colin, has Nano uh, it traded any decentralization for the sake of scale? Right, so the approach that Nano takes with decentralization is we try to make the consensus model as light and as accessible as possible in order to get the most amount of people in order participating in consensus. When you do things the other way, when consensus is, is difficult in order to generate, what happens is you get a type of emergent uh, centralization where many, many people can't participate simply because they don't have the economies of scale in order to generate the consensus mechanism. So Nano, by allowing incredibly cheap systems to drive the consensus in the network, we can make sure that anyone has access to being able to, um, to be part of the consensus and be more decentralized than solutions that are expensive. Wait, 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 wait. Right. You're a de distributed proof of stake. It's just the privileged nodes that get to decide what are you talking about with it's consensus? representative it's, proof it, of stake where balance it, holders get to choose their representatives so yeah so it's a it's a senate that gets to decide well it's, ba it's balance holders rather than non-participating members what, for instance uh, you would uh, not get to participate because you don't have nano that's right. i would get to participate some because i have some and then anyone that has nano can but, pick their representative at any time and but they're, they're, they're the consensus. ones that decide. There's no real consensus involved. Other Why than would the somebody outside that are of the system get to participate in the consensus no, of the no, system? No, no, that the, makes the, no, no. The, the actual people that are the DPOS nodes, they're the only ones that get to vote. Yeah, they're picked by the people that have a balance in the system. Yeah, right. Again, this is a Senate or a, a, an elite group that gets to decide. I don't the see that how that's at all group? decentralized. That's centralized. Those are the people with power. All right. So... Let's compare on-chain versus off-chain scaling solutions. Why would you want to scale on-chain or why would you want to put that onto a, a second layer, a side chain, et cetera? Uh, because blockchains are very expensive. That's, I mean, that, that's kind of, exp that, that's a very obvious reason. Uh, a lot of people on Bitcoin Cash seem to think that everything needs to be on chain because that's, that's what's worked in the past and that's always the way towards the future. Uh, but, you know, on, on chain is very expensive. Blockchains are very expensive. Uh, you know, we were talking about Ethereum earlier. When you, when you store data on Ethereum, it's very expensive. Uh, that's because everyone has to store it, everyone has to transmit it, everyone has to validate it. This is very expensive. Uh, uh, and if you have a thousand nodes on the network instead of uh, versus a centralized one, you have a thousand times the cost. Uh, something like Lightning is a lot more efficient. Only the two players or the two or, or the people involved in the route of over Lightning, they're the only ones that need to store or transmit or validate those transactions. So that's a lot more efficient. So second layer solutions, I think, are in a way allowing, uh, by settling on the first layer, allow that efficiency, it allow that additional capacity, and that, that's a very good thing. That's a great innovation. Uh, you could scale on chain. That, that is a possibility, and we did that with SegWit. A lot of people refuse to acknowledge that, and I hate that people don't want to acknowledge that because it was a block size increase. But, you know, people don't want to say it for some reason because they didn't get their way or they, they have marketing arms and 
they own Bitcoin.com or whatever. Uh, but, the, I, uh, but the fact of the matter is you, you do things in a way that's voluntary. And that's what Bitcoin does. It, you give everyone self-sovereignty. You allow them to choose their own way. You don't have to accept SegWit transactions. You don't have to validate SegWit transactions. You don't have to accept SegWit transactions. But if you want to, that's great because there's a whole other economy of people that want it. And that's, that's how uh, Bitcoin scales and it's, it's based on a voluntarism. Um, yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, but I would say, you know, it depends on the blockchain. Uh, if for example, there was a blockchain that had char uh, like charts and was super efficient in the way that it um, can operate, then perhaps it would make sense to do everything on the blockchain. But fundamentally, it would still be similar to a layer two solution where um, some main chain does validation while sub chains uh, do some, of the, some more of the heavy lifting for each of the applications that are built on top of it. So, you know, um, in our case, we're a second layer solution because what we do is specialize. You know, we specialize in uh, privacy preserving computation and we have attributes that are fundamentally different from those of Ethereum, for example. But by using a chain like Ethereum, uh, one that um, can, you know, has some security properties that we may not have if we had our own independent chain, then we um, can inherit those properties while um, continuing to have the, at the attributes that we need to be as efficient as we can. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So we can do cheap things a lot cheaper, like run computations a lot cheaper than they would if they were run on Ethereum. And we can store a large amount of data that uh, we can store on Ethereum. And you know, so we can have our own distinct attribute while inheriting the security property of the main chain. Yeah. All right, Colin, Marco, on-chain so, versus off-chain? Yeah, Nano is not expensive. Uh, as an on-chain solution, and any second layer solutions that are in any other system can be applied on top of it as well. It's, it depends on what you want to build on top of. Do you want to build on top of something that is light and fast, or do you want to top of, build on top of something that is slow and expensive? Man, I, I'm sitting right in the middle of this one, though. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yep. No, it's true, though. So, so um, we, we are a traditional blockchain in the, you know, the same sense that Bitcoin is, so on-chain is expensive, and you want to only put stuff on there that really needs to be on there, so nothing else. Um, and everything else needs to not be on-chain. Uh, you can track it on the chain, you can do some other magical and you know, put a second layer on top of it, but if it doesn't belong on the chain, I, I kind of don't see the point of putting it there. So, um, so I, I'm okay with chain space being scarce and expensive. Okay. Cool. All right, we're going to do one more question. So back to the focus on security, right? Proof of work is seen as necessary because it's what makes Bitcoin secure. But it also gets a lot of criticism for wasting a lot of energy. So is proof of work necessary or would it be fantastic to have a chain that did not require that sort of energy input? Well, if you're centralized already, proof of work doesn't really make that much sense. But if you are decentralized digital scarce money, then yes, you need proof of work. It's a feature, not a bug. You want, it, you want money to be hard to produce because otherwise people go into the money production business. And that's, uh, that's something I talked about in my previous talk over here. But uh, it's a feature, not a bug, when you have decentralized digital money. Uh, for, almost a lot, uh, for a lot of other stuff, it doesn't really make sense. Um, you are kind of wasting, uh, if, if you're not trying to be hard money, or if you're not trying to be sound money, then you know, maybe a centralized system works better. And, uh, and, and you know, I, I mean, I think that's what distributed proof of stake is. It's a centralized system. Uh, and you, know, you, you don't need proof of work if you have a centralized system. Of course, if you are completely centralized and have like a central database and everything, that would be even more efficient. And I think whatever your project is, you're ripe for disruption by something that's completely centralized. Uh, and do it more efficiently for less money if, if that's the direction you're going in. So proof of work is necessary for hard money, which Bitcoin is. For other projects, I don't know if it makes sense. Okay, anyone else? Is proof of work necessary? Yes, for the same reasons that uh, Jimmy said. I, I actually agree with that statement. Um, so I also think that the uh, it is expensive debate is a bit overblown at this point. Uh, seen a lot of 
faux analysis, if you will, going on. Um, I don't know. I, I am unconvinced that the amount of energy spent is um, is is accurate. Uh, yeah, they, they just multiply numbers, right? I mean, a lot of the energy that these miners use is excess capacity. It's, it's, it's waste heat that would have gone into the atmosphere. Uh, There's they, an opportunity cost to that, too, because that could have been spent on something productive. Absolutely. But uh, <laughs> if you call proof of work productive, then, then it is productive. Yeah, like the, the, talking about the money is worth it because how much money went into mining it um, also doesn't make economic sense. That, that's talking about the labor theory. That you theory. don't know economics. It's, it's talking about the labor theory of value. How hard is it to do something? Marxist is that how much here. it's worth? Yeah. It actually is what is the demand theory of value? Is how much does somebody want this? So it's, it's a property of how much does somebody want to use your bitcoins? That's what gives the value. It doesn't matter how much energy was spent to produce them. And that's, uh, that's a terrible view of economics that's not supported uh, that's by all anything modern in history, economics. So that's fine. Please quote you, that. But you believe that. You believe that. Let's see Please how that works. Please write that down. Right? That's his quote. <laughs> All right, well, I think we are at time, which okay. is a shame because that was a very lively conversation. So thank you, gentlemen. Okay. And, uh, thank you.